огонь погас, а в ручейке вода нагрелась, забрыла, закипела. So I have joining me today Dan Mitten, who is a DMA candidate from the University of Toronto, and he is a bass singer. And today we're going to talk about the specific characteristics of the bass voice and also some of the unique training challenges that the lower voice male faces, especially when it comes to singing in the higher range and navigating that upper passaggio area. So welcome. Hi. It's great to be here. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. So uh, tell us a little bit about your own voice and your own background in terms of, you know, what you've performed and, and what kind of a bass are you? Oh, okay. Um, so um, there are a few stripes of bass. So I, you know, for choral purposes, let's say I, yes, squarely in the bass section. As a solo artist, um, there are a bunch of German classifications called Fach, and Fach just means a pigeonhole. Um, and <laughs> my particular Fach is called Sirius or Bass, which means serious bass. Um, so I sing gods and fathers and kings and demons, basically anything that's um, masculine authority. That's my job. Um, <laughs> I love that. Right? Um, although, you know, there, there, there's a couple of couple of digressions but for the most part that's what opera needs you to be because opera is essentially based on commedia dell'arte characters right and so we, we go back to, to archetypes so um i've had a small regional career uh, i live and work in toronto uh, i did a gig for opera new brunswick uh many years ago uh, i did a zarastra out there which was really fulfilling and really nice um but uh, I've played, you know, uh, Angelotti in Tosca a few times and Sparafucile uh, from Rigoletto, uh, which is a, a great role. And I play Zorastro, I play Bartolo from Marriage of Figaro. Um, and uh, in the last couple of years, I have gotten into Wagner repertoire. So um, Hagen from Goethe Dämmerung or um, the last... Um, big project I, I did was uh, a scene uh, from Parsifal where I played Gournemans, who was the, the bass lead in that particular opera. Um, and it's been a real um, pleasure to sort of fall into Wagnerian rep. It, it really fits well. Um, so that's, that's great. Um, but while we're talking about Fach and uh, Fesha, which is the, the plural of that, um, uh, I guess I can talk about where that comes from a lot if you want to like is that is that part of the conversation is that what you want to know about sure we can talk the, about the that um type. i do want to draw that distinction though between fach and the choral distinction for bass or that that you know the voice part right so i think oftentimes it's it's assumed that you know if you're assigned in the bass part or assigned the bass part in the chorus that you're also necessarily a bass which is not the case we're talking about an actual voice classification here and the bass parts that are sung in a choir are just typically sung by male singers who are not tenors <laughs> so, right. or who don't have at least the tenor training or extension so it will be sung also by baritones as well as the rare you know bass because as we've talked about before that you know basses are really kind of a rare a rare voice type a true mm -hmm. a true bass singer yep you're right. Uh, I like what you had to say is male singers that aren't tenors, because um, I do feel like um, choral rep kind of does understand, you know, tenor and not tenor. And uh, we have only really had baritones as sort of that middle ground for the last 200 years or so. Baritones first make an appearance in like the first quarter of the 19th century. Um, and before that, in Handel and, and Mozart rap anyway, they were clearly writing for baritones, but they just would call them basses because that's what you called them. There was no word for middle low voice, right? So in my world, as I, as I look at my research, um, there are definitely, so in, in the male voice spectrum, there are treble voices like countertenors way up top. There are legit tenors. There are baritones, which in my world would be a middle low voice. 
uh, or a, a, sorry, a, a, a middle male voice, excuse me. And then there are the rest of us, bass baritones and basses, and we form a spectrum of low male voices. So within that spectrum, because we were talking about Fa, um, this this guy, this is uh, Kloiber. It's a, a book that's put out um, with a lot of opera uh, in it, and it's meant to um, assign roles to voice types. Um, and there's two ways that that works. It works for the theaters. It works for the houses themselves because they get more bang from their buck. If they hire a specific, let's say, a specific kind of soprano, or in my case, a specific kind of bass, they can expect them to play roles X, Y, and Z because it's in this book that you have to kind of. Um, but it also works for the singer because if you're a specific stripe of soprano or tenor, or in my case, bass, if I'm a zero years or bass, I can't be asked to sing roles that apply to other stripes of bass. So they can't make you sing something outside your fach. Now, everybody's voices are different. This is, you know, an, a, sort of a, an abstract thing. And, and a lot of people find that they can cross fecha. And that's great. Um, but it's just sort of a guideline. Now, that's the German system. But there's a, I wouldn't say it's a competing system. I would say it's a, a different perspective is the American perspective. And this is Boldry. Um, he put this book out, The Guide to Operatic Roles and Arias, with the same kind of the same kind of idea as the Kloiber, but he gives them different names. So for the German system, for Kloiber, um, he gives bases or, or basically low male voices four categories. So they are Spielbass or Bass Buffo, that's what one type is, and then Schwere Spielbass, which is a heavy play bass. Um, also called a schwere bass buffo, and then carta bass, which is also known as bass baritone or bass baritone, and then finally me, zirioso bass. Those are the four for Kloiber. But on the American system, the Boldry calls them bass baritone, and then comic bass, lyric bass, and dramatic bass. They don't line up exactly. So somebody from one of these, like you might find that that a certain role that that Boldry assigns to one of his categories might not fit to its exact translation of the Kloiber and vice versa, but it's close enough for singers to sort of piece together where they might fit in the spectrum. All right, so can we talk then a little bit about, um, you can use either classification system you'd like, but maybe talk a little bit about at least those on the lower end of the low voice spectrum and those on the, you know, more lyric or lighter end or higher, and the bass baritone, just a few of the characteristics. I know, again, any, every individual voice is just unique to some extent, but there are certain characteristics that I think that are sort of common that help us classify the voices into those yeah, applications. Sure. Yeah, and I, I, I like where you're going with that. Also, um, Richard Miller uh, wrote a great book about low male voices, and he says that tone color kind of decides Fach more than anything. I mean, of course, it's going to be, you know, how low, how high can you sing? Um, but tone color and the tessitura, where you're comfortable singing, that's going to determine um, which kind of pigeonhole you, you eventually assign yourself to. Um, we can talk about the weight of a voice as sort of a constructive way. So a lot of baritones will have a comparatively lighter tone. Um, like a, like a, they can have you know a nice a nice good heft to the sound, but it's it's going to sound lighter by comparison to a heavier bass because um, a legit bass is going to sound just a little bit darker. There are, there's always um, a variation. Like for instance, if I think of some of the great basses from back in the day, like Cesare Siepi, the Italian bass, undeniable bass, but his sound is more. Um, <sighs> Just qualitatively, just maybe a little bit more to the sound. Um, when you compare him to somebody like Gyalgo, which is a super amazing Bulgarian bass, he's probably the most famous bass from after um, after the war. Um, so, low male voice, dark color. Um, stentorian is an adjective in like to um, Substantial. I think the gender typified, but archetypally masculine is still valid in terms of describing a big voice. Um, and different nationalities will 
write for different covers of bass. For instance, I don't get to sing a lot of French music. Um, I'm fluent in French, it'd be great if I could, but they just don't write for my particular stripe of bass. Um, the French national aesthetic writes for something called Bariton Martin, which is a medium voice and, and it's about agility and élan. It's not about gravitas, right? So my home base uh, is more in German repertoire or you know, where my research sits in Russian repertoire. Russians really get what a legit bass voice is. It's um, very gratifying to discover a uh, repertoire that's um, tailor-made for me 200 years ago, you know, or 100 years ago. Like, they, you know, how could they know that my voice worked this way? It's amazing. Is that how you and ended up becoming so interested in studying Russian and, and using Russian as a, a tool for helping the bass singer? I, you know, wouldn't that be when a great... Discovering the repertoire, I mean, in your own singing? Yeah, wouldn't that be wouldn't that be an elegant linear narrative if that were true? Um, <laughs> like, I know that you and I both share a passion for languages. And um, when I was an undergraduate, uh, one of my soprano colleagues, who's a very gifted singer, was singing some stuff in Russian, and I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. And so I took Russian as a class and developed a passion for that language. I'm not Russian. But my people are like Irish, German, maybe, you know, even Canadians forever. But um, I've always loved Russian as a language. And uh, since I already speak French and am pretty handy at Italian and German, I thought I'd give Russian a try and found that it, it just fits. So um, it's luck more than anything. Okay. But, but as we talked about before, you know, the basis of articulation of Russian, I think, um, gives a happy handshake to... Um, bel canto goals for low male voices in particular. I think it's great for everybody. I just didn't want to have to defend Rachmaninoff's soprano output in my dissertation. So <laughs> we take our narrow slices. Yeah. Okay, good. So I, a quick question too, since we're talking about, you know, the, the bass singer having sort of that, well, centurion, but the, the more, we'll say robust kind of yeah, um, robust quality, timbre. Um, how does, I never know how to word this, but so we take, let's say, a baritone who has a great lower extension and who is maybe a little bit more, you know, has a little more vocal weight naturally, a little bit more of a dramatic instrument, um, and he's able to sing down to that lower extension. I know that tessitura, um, the area in the, the range where the singer does the bulk of his singing, is going to be really, really important. You know, how much time can he spend in that lower range? without really feeling like he's fatiguing and what have you. Whereas a bass singer will be able to sit in a lower tessitura for a longer period of time. That's something that came up in, you know, my interviews with uh, Michelle Breit, um, same thing that, you know, she's a mezzo, not because she can't sing the high notes, but because that's kind of where she goes on vacation, then she comes back home. And, and she goes back to that sort of mezzo tessitura where she's, she's just, she spends most of her time. So I think because misclassification is so common, um, you get those singers who are physically able to produce those lower notes. So they start to assume, especially if they can't sing the higher notes because they just don't have the technique in place, they start to assume that they then are bass singers or bass voices. And just how do we, how do we separate that? How do we make sure that we have baritones, dramatic baritones being classified as dramatic baritones and basses being classified as basses? Well, you're asking a bunch of great questions, and I actually like your wording around this. You're very, you're very um, apt with um, low extension for your baritone versus tessitura for your bass, and that really is the distinction in my mind. Um, we've always got a baritone around who's got a party trick low C. Like that's great. It's just the, you know, the reliability, the and and the vocal health. You know, how long he can actually um, output that note and whether or not it's usable in in concert is another another question. Um, but I want to talk a bit about classification just so I understand where you're coming from. Are you talking about classification of solo singers or are you talking about the choral classifications? I'm really talking more of solo singers. Solo yeah, the sing choral, cause again, the, the, to me, the choral classifications are not really classifications. They're voice parts to me. Um, and they're yeah. sort of lumping several classifications into this bass part. And so okay. I'm not really thinking, and I'm thinking more in terms of your classical soloist. Okay, so I want to, uh, and you'll hear this from any number of sources, I want to caution against um, premature classification. Uh, and what I mean by that is, um, 
I am a legit base, but when I was an undergraduate, nobody would use that word. And you'll find that undergraduate low male voice outcome singers more so now, but, but back in the day, we're not called basses. Um, we were called baritones because nobody wanted to commit to an outcome, right? Um, I think that's an important philosophy. Now, Miller talks about how your spoken voice, your, 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 the pitch range of your natural speech is a very good indicator of what fach you'll line, uh, wind up in, right? And so those, re those really dark bases, you know, you, you recognize the type. Um, who speak down around a, like a low G sharp, that's kind of their, their place, um, or even a low F sharp for the really dark ones. It's pretty clear, you know, unless you're pressing down to achieve that, if they just naturally phonate around that register, probably, you know, base outcome is a pretty good bet. Um, for myself, I tend to phonate, you know, if you, if you had to clock my, my pitch right now, it's probably around an A3. Um, is that right? Yeah, about, about an A3, I think. Um, and you know, you can, uh, test this afterward. Um, it, it's okay. a surprise to me because I have a comparatively high speaking voice for the fach that I am. That's uh, just an, another weird thing. Um, but we do see more and more that, um, like for instance, um, uh, Miller gives us a chart and there's another great book, uh, by Davidson Latour. Um, sorry, it's this one, um, vocal technique. Um, where they also give a sort of a, a chart that, that shows that, you know, bass baritones sort of speak around B flat, you know, and then tenors speak higher and higher and higher. Um, so speaking voice can be a giveaway. Um, but it can also be deceptive. It can all, but in, and again, in my case, it can also be deceptive. Um, premature classification is, uh, can be a problem because you don't want to be pigeonholing somebody where they don't belong. All this goes to say that, I've heard it said that you are the fach that you get hired for. So um, if the young artist is in a position where they're starting to get a few bites and a few gigs and the rep that they're singing feels great, then you can kind of look that rep up in Kloiber and see what it is and then reverse engineer that and try out the next thing that's next to it in that category and see if it fits. And if it fits, it's sort of a heuristic process of trial and error that way, right? I think that's a fair approach. I think um, giving somebody the, you know, you are a, you know, spiel tenor or whatever, uh, is not a great tactic. I think it's better to see the emergent fach than assigning one. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. It's, I, I always say, yeah, don't prematurely classify the voice. Don't be in a hurry to, but really, I always say, just listen to what your voice is telling you. Sing the repertoire that makes your voice happy. <laughs> but it just, always. Feels, but it really just feels like it fits. It's well, gotta fit you properly. You've got, a, you've got it exactly, and the wording that you're using is perfect because listen to what your voice is telling you. That baritone who's got the low extension knows it's a low extension. He knows it's a party trick, and that's okay, you know, and the yeah. choral ensemble may need that from him, or he may need to double his, you know, basis for a while, but he knows his voice doesn't live there. Listen to your voice. Your voice will tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. um, we do see, and this is again in the, the Davids and Latour book. Um, it's a great book. I want to recommend it to you. Um, they do talk about larger voices that have short tops um, because it's tougher to navigate, say, head voice. It's tougher to navigate that coordination that will let you bridge the, the passaggio. And um, so sometimes you'll get a tenor outcome singer singing in a bass section. And for me, uh, in my undergraduate here, that actually was the case. Sitting next to me was this guy who had easy, free high Gs, could sing up on a high A. I can't even phonate up there. Right, but he was standing next to me in the bass section. So, oh. you know, and, but we were kids in our 20s, you know, 24, 25. That's still too early to be making any kind of pronouncements about where you're going to wind up. So many, many years later, I discover that he's a tenor. Okay, you know. Right. So, that, well, I guess coming back to, you know, just when you should classify a voice, um, obviously earlier on, listen to what your voice is telling you, find repertoire that just really fits with where you're at, that feels comfortable, but in terms of the maturation of the voice, right? I mean, there's a certain period that it goes through where it's just maturing and it's and it's kind of settling into what it's going to be. And and only then, I think, and only once you get a certain degree of technical mastery, 
should you actually start to classify the voice. And so I don't know if you want to talk at all about ages. I know it's there's going to be a broad range probably, but um, you know when, when it would be wise to to classify the voice. You know, you're asking a bunch of really great questions that are so nuanced and anything I say, I mean, I, I'm trying to understand uh, a viewer of this video um, positioning themselves based on what I have to say about this stuff. And I, I worry about that just because, and you, I hate to repeat what everyone else says, but every singer is different. Um, and I, just, just by point of illustrating that. Um, so I told you that a couple of years ago, um, I got interested in Wagner repertoire. And so I participated in the American Wagner project and was, and I did uh, Jane Eaglin's Wagner camp when she was at Baldwin Wallace. And um, it, it's just been a really fulfilling thing to respond so much to that, that repertoire. And going to those, you know, to those artist programs, um, I met my tribe. And they all have faces like mine, right? Um, it, and it was such a surprise to wander into a space where I am a medium-sized person, you know. Um, wow. <laughs> but, right, right. Um, I have a friend who's a Heldon tenor who's 6'5", and he's got this big potato head. He's amazing, you know. But, but that's, just what, that's just what my stripe, that's one of the manifestations that my stripe can have. Um, I'm a rarity among rarities in that sense th that I think other basses with less dramatic or less hefty voices will mature sooner. So I can tell you that I started making my first marketable, hireable, grown up daddy sounds around 35. Okay. And, yeah. And that is very late uh, because I have a girlfriend who has been living in France since she was 24 and she was just amazing. And, or an, another friend of mine who, uh, you know, we, we did Tanglewood together and she's the uh, uh, COC artist in residence this year. And she sounded amazing since she was 20, 23 or whenever we were in the program together. Right. So she's had that facility and that wherewithal with her instrument for maybe, you know, a little over 10 years longer than I had. Right, um, so that goes to say that it's not definitive, but it does seem to me that higher voices mature faster. It does seem to me that lighter voices mature faster. So if by contrast, you're a lower voice and you're a heavier voice, you can expect that maturation arc to be quite a bit longer. There's always somebody who, who is a little precocious. There's a, a guy here, um, a bass who's, who uh, just sang in, in uh, the Goethe Demerung they had at the COC. And I knew him when he was 17 and he had, he had uh, some stuff figured out. And, you know, I've seen him sing a, a Mahler 8 and he's totally convincing and he's been singing very well for the last 15 years. And that's amazing. But I think he's the exception to the exception of the exception, right? Right. I think what you were saying um, is pretty reflective of what a lot of other vocal pedagogues have have stated in terms of maturation um, with regards to lighter, higher voices tending to mature a little bit earlier and more dramatic voices and lower voices maturing a little bit later. That seems pretty consistent with what all the other singing teachers seem to be finding as well. So yeah, we don't have to give it a specific age per se, um, what we can, when we can expect that because I think you're right. There's always the risk too that we're setting ourselves up for um, putting too much pressure on ourselves and also feeling disappointed if our voices haven't matured by a given age and we're thinking, you know, oh, what's wrong with me? Why, why haven't I, you know, why haven't I reached that, that point yet? And, and we don't want to be doing that because then we're really kind of approaching singing then from a bad psychological framework, bad psychological place emotionally. You're so, you're so right. And I think that you really get it. Um, so that self doubt can be part of it. And that no, no, no pedagogy really goes into the self doubt that accompanies, Oh, what's wrong with me, which, you know, I certainly thought that. Um, so there's self doubt on the one hand, and there's frustration on the other, because if you have a keen intellect and you're musical and you know how a phrase should be shaped or how, how you hear it in your mind's eye and your instrument isn't responding, to that nuance, that is frustration. And it's difficult to cope with as an artist, right? So being patient with yourself and even hearing somebody tell you be patient with yourself is a frustration on its own. So we all need to sort of make the music that we can until we can make the music that we want. 
I like that. I, I, I work with students who are older than 19 and I, I'm hesitant to classify their voices. I'm just like, hey, you don't really have the technique in place yet. So, you know, it's like the example of the, your tenor in the choir, right, where he just didn't have, you know, or I, I run into this a lot where you see tenors who just, they're tenors, but they don't know it yet because they just haven't figured out how to navigate the upper part yeah. of their voices. And it's not because That's they're not tenors. They sort of resign yes. themselves to, oh, well, I'm, I'm a lower voiced singer, but in actuality, you listen to them, you're like, no, you're not. You just haven't figured it out technically yet. Yep. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Um, I think we agree. Oh, great. So, yeah. So, um, let's talk a little bit about, we kind of started to, to move into that, and I think we went off a little rabbit trail, but um, navigating the upper passaggio for the lower voice. Okay. Why is that so difficult? For so many lower voice males, what what makes it so difficult, and what can they do to sort of achieve a better balance going through that passaggio? Okay, um, uh, when you ask that, I get a split screen, and I have my own personal experience, and then I have my own pedagogical learning. So I'd like to give it a go from each of those aspects, if you don't mind. Share both. So Dan is a young bassling. I maxed out at middle C. I could not, for the life of me, you know, it, D was um, just terrible and and in all the rep when you see an e natural in it i mean the bass rep is still peppered with e naturals because that's the climactic money note for a bass couldn't you know um that uh, that figure are de libe le turban de libe splat blah, you know couldn't couldn't sing it um that being said um it's important that even young bass outcome singers experiment with their falsetto. That is just the, the no brainer. And it was actually never taught to me, um, but I would engage in a lesson in supervised falsetto singing with a low male voice outcome singer. Um, specifically, you know, like oohs up top and five note scales down. Ooh, 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 ooh. You hear how it starts to mix, right? Mm -hmm. That's uh, just a really gentle way to start to get to know your upper tessitura without putting too many demands on it. Um, I like, um, there's a different book that I, that I uh, wanna share with you. I don't know if you know Christopher Arneson's work. Mm. So, so this book is uh, literature for teaching. And in it, he talks about baby basses. He says, um, and I'm just, it's like, uh, paragraph and a half here if you don't mind he oh. says uh, a true bass is very rare basses have a different vocal color than baritones and bass baritones and there's a tendency for bass voices to be less flexible than higher voices because of the thickness of the vocal folds so i like how he brings it to a physiological reality rather than just you know oh they're just that way who knows why anyway right. so we have our folds uh, surprise as a result, young basses want to make their sound darker than necessary, and that absolutely was the case for me. Um, this can lead to register violations and trouble balancing the middle and upper re re registers, which is true, or upper ranges, he says. Finding repertoire for a baby bass can be difficult and often requires transposition, and that's true. I sang, you know, as a younger singer, I sang a lot of art song in transposition. Um, pianists love six flats. <laughs> <laughs> Things to look for in repertoire include dotted rhythms, vowels O, U, E, or mixed vowels, so that's our U and E, uh, right? Mm -hmm. uh, around the passaggio, and so the passaggio for uh, a bass is going to be around D, D flat. Oh, well, D, can D, D, yeah, C, C sharp-ish, C sharp D. Um, it says uh, around the passaggio to allow the voice to turn over and masculine text, yet appropriate for the age range. A good range for pieces for a young bass would be A2 to A3, which sounds pretty conservative, right? Um, I also want to go back to one of the bits that Arneson talks about here uh, just briefly, and he says um, to allow the voice to turn over, which brings me into Ken's work. Do you mind if we digress there for just a quick mm -hmm. second? My viewers are now familiar with Ken Bozeman and right? his work. So. Um, so gone are the days where we can just say point blank, the bass break is at C sharp, the bass break is at D. That's, that's old thinking. Now we understand, thanks to Ken Bozeman's work, that um, 
that particular pitch of turning over has something to do with the vowel itself that we're using. Um, and in particular, E and U share sort of a lower first formant that we can, that we can use to help us navigate the passaggio. Um, his, uh, he's got two books, and in, in this one, he gives a set of turnings for, I guess, seven vowels. Um, it's, they're all variations on uh, E, A, A, O, U, right? Uh, oh, and then in this one, on his, I'm sorry, that, that chart is available on his website as well. If so in, in this one, which is Practical Vocal Acoustics from 2013, it's on page 125, he makes a couple of slight alterations to the turning points with the book that he published in 2017. For low male voice anyway, he's sort of tweaking, reconsidering by a semitone only, so don't, don't worry about it, where kind of E, closed, closed E sort of turns and where um, uh, U sort of turns. Um, it's, a good, it's a good idea if you're a keen low male voice student uh, and you're interested in this sort of thing, you can actually go through your repertoire because we're all good at IPA now, right? Uh, and we can go through our repertoire and understand where our closed E's are going to happen, where our U's are, and then compare them to what we know about where we're likely to have a turn. And in that way, we can prepare ourselves better. We can actually um, experiment with that passive vowel modification to help us navigate those, those turns. Again, that's something you want to be doing with the, the help of a teacher. I mean, I don't think... You can bake this particular cake on your own. It's sort of, it's sort of an assisted process. But these are the tools that I might use if I uh, if I were a keener. I'd bring these to my teacher and say, "I read this. What do you think?" Right. And of course, I mean, Ken is very quick to state too, and it says it as the title that there are approximate turning over points, approximate first formants, because it really, I mean, there's a little smaller spectrum. So each bass voice will be within a certain range of first form, right. but not necessarily specifically on that specific pitch or frequency. Um, so oh, yes, there's always yes. a little variation from bass singer to bass singer as well. And I'm glad you said that because that, that's a caveat for our bean counters out there who need something to be specific and precise. Well, you know, that ambiguity is the art and that ambiguity is the experience of singing and that ambiguity is you fiddling around with your instrument and figuring out your own voice. So. And I think that's the really important thing too. One of the things that I find when I'm working, because I, I work a lot with male singers. I don't know why it is, but the majority of my students are male singers. And um, most of them are in sort of the baritone range. I have a few tenors, but most are baritones. And um, I'm on that spectrum. And it's really interesting because, you know, as we go through um, teaching them this idea of turning over, I find that partly probably because of habits that they have of raising the larynx and, and so forth or trying to overweight the instrument is that the instrument seems to always want to turn over earlier initially rather than later when we first start introducing this concept to them of allowing that to happen it's very strange and then over time we we're able to sort of kind of delay that a little bit without you know any kind of register violation, right? Without without getting to the point where they're singing aperta and they're you know they're they're in that yell coordination. Um, yeah. But I just find that as the coordination starts to improve, that starts to kind of extend a little bit, and they actually start kind of matching up a little bit more closely to what Ken is saying, you know, in in his book that this is about the approximate turnover point for the vowels. I don't know if you find that at all. With do you work? You don't work with a lot of lower voiced male students, do you? Uh, I, I, well, I, you know, I've, I've, I've taught a couple baritones and I, my, um, I taught group voice lessons to our um, graduate student choral conductors and they were baritones for the most part. Um, but I, yeah, I haven't, uh, I haven't interfaced with a lot of legit basses because it's really, you know, it's like the, the four, four leaf clover, you, it's rare to find them. Um, Coming back to what you had to say about coming back to what you had to say about early turning points, that I'd say is common for low male voice outcome singers, um, and it's very interesting because it sort of arcs back to what I was telling you about finding my tribe. So the last sort of Wagner thing I did, uh, I participated in Reno a couple summers ago now, in um, the American Wagner Project, which is under the umbrella of the uh, Inst uh, Institute for Young Dramatic Voices, which is run by Dolores Zatchik. She's a, an American mezzo. And she would give us group voice lessons, group warm-ups. And her, uh, one of her um, great concerns was that the voice not turn over too soon. 
So she'd hear, you know, these robust Heldon tenors and robust Verdi baritones um, covering too soon. And she'd be like, nope, nope, stay open. So there's a real level of artistic acumen that goes into the balance between the safety that covering might provide you with and the aperta that we need for a, a real robust, exciting delivery and one that's safe, you know? So we're, we're always balancing. And you're finding that singers, you know, with the big Mack truck instruments like to be safe. They like to, you know, like that. But what's exciting is to have the turn happen just a little bit later than they might like. But that's... Well, I think what happens like, is when you, when you first introduce them to this concept of, especially because I work with, with a lot of CCM singers, um, not classical singers primarily, um, a few here and there, but um, when you introduce them to this idea of not just splatting everything, not just singing everything open, and I always like to say to teach them both ways so that they have both on their palate. So let's say they want to, you have a baritone and he's got a G in the song that he's singing. Well, you can sing that open or you can sing it closed voice. Like giving him that option yep. as a pop or rock singer to be able to sing it different ways, depending on how he wishes to color the vocal phrase oh, or the particular a, word. A singer, the cross training is so big. I'm such a fan of, of cross training styles, yes. But then what I found was, as I was training this, and I work with the students that I work with, um, is that because it takes so much more athleticism than we can, we've ever experienced to be able to actually sing on that cusp of open and closed. Like, right where it's not shouty splatty, but it's not quite turned over to like prematurely. And that's the, the hard, I think that's why we do it because it is such a, um, a challenging coordination. It's very efficient when we get it right. But initially I feel like we're, there's a little bit of balance. It's hard. It's so much work. And I tend to, you know, like oftentimes what happens is we, we cover too soon and we cover too heavy. Like we let the, the vowel turn over, but then we're like, I need to stay low larynx. And we're, we're not necessarily thinking it, you know, like consciously on a conscious level, but we're thinking, okay, well, in order to stabilize the vocal tract in some way or another to, to not lose the depth in the sound and to not go into open voice above a given point, then I think what we do is we just kind of go, I mean, we just weight it down. Exactly. And even as a light instrument, that's what I started doing, which is, really kind of ironic <laughs> but also I, I would just want to bring it back to uh, and give it a gendered perspective um, so as a female singer um, you're also um, um, sort of working in the arena of your middle register and its transition and male singers uh, male low male voice outcome singers don't really have that um, generally speaking my whole career is, as an opera singer now this, it's not true in in CCM styles because there's a lot more freedom to uh, experiment with with um, head voice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But as an opera singer, my entire career is spent in mode one. You know, I don't ever leave that kind of and it, it all the so if my range, if my singable range is from low C, let's say it's uh, C two, all the way up to F sharp four is what I would say is legit. Although yesterday I sang a G sharp four, big deal, um, <laughs> right? Uh, that entire range, even though I know you know there's a mix element that's happening up there in order to enable that, the affect of that entire compass is um, mode one or chest or heavy mechanism or whatever you want to call it. And that is not the case for female singers. Y'all are definitely, you, you have your low, you have your high business, and then you have that bit you need to fill in in the middle. That is not the case for low male voices. We have our voice and then it ends until we figure out how to make it go on. Like it's, it's just a slight, um, it's, I think it's physiological, I think it's acoustic, I think uh, it's mental and artistic, but the issues are slightly and subtly different. I do not envy because female middle register for me is still uh, this amazing mystery of, of possibility. You know, It's not something I've ever um, experienced on my own, and so I live vicariously through my female students. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. Well, so males in general, though you have a much longer chest register much broader you know m1 just yeah kind of feel like that comparatively speaking yeah yeah and it's, it's I, I think that you know that's why i think generally speaking males tend to do a lot more singing in m1 
generally speaking, than females do. And we spend a lot of time in that funky middle range where it can be either or. <laughs> you know, just trying to figure that out. And yeah. Either or is a good space though, because you have more options there and you have, you have more color. Anytime that there's a, that kind of a partnership, a blend between your two kind of extremes is a, an opportunity to play with the ratio and that is color. So that's great. Have you seen uh, Reed's books, um, Cornelius Reed? Mm -hmm. So there's a diagram that he does that's sort of cross gender, cross voice type. He has the scale and he shows where the, like universally where the, the um, acoustic passaggio events sort of sort of happen, and because my voice is only Kate, like you know, it's a whole it's a whole spectrum from you know X to Y, and because my voice is only capable of phonating in this, you can see that I only get to have one major registration event. But for some for women who have like you know, so what do I have? I have let's say I have a what is you know C to F sharp is like two and a half octaves, right? It's no big deal. But for a man, it's all I need. For women with four octave ranges, you guys have more of those registration events that you have to negotiate. So you really do acoustically, just because of where you sit and where your voice operates, you have more possibility, but you also have more complication. I don't know if it's fair to say more complication because honestly, for a young bass trying to figure out how to hurdle his D natural, that's, you know, that's a show stop. Like it's a, it's a deal breaker there. So until you figure that out, you're kind of stuck singing you know, in a, in a very restricted register. I want to go back to something. Um, you were singing that descending scale pattern earlier on. Ooh, and you, yeah. and you were talking about exploring your falsetto, you know? Um, so I always use those low first formant vowels, E's and O's for helping facilitate yeah. that move into M2 head voice. Um, so is that something that you do as well in, in terms of helping a lower voice male just sort of be able to navigate that, use those vowels initially, the oohs, because you instantly went to an oo. So is that just an easier vowel for, for training that, that higher range? Yeah, you know, a while back um, at uh, U of T, I, I lectured on um, the male expanding voice, which is basically um, post puberty well, during puberty and post puberty when when a male emerges so he's probably been a, a soprano and then is emerging with a, a new voice and is trying to figure out how to to work it um and those those exercises with ooh those little five note scales descending is the traditional approach to unif to register unification that way right and that carries over into what we're doing um, for for high high for low male voices, I would say working up higher, allowing it to be falsetto, and just getting a sense for what that that can be to operate in that um, builds good muscle memory, and it habituates you to working in that tessitura where you otherwise might be, you know, looking to to jam your larynx up. As long as you can be chill and go, whoo, whoo, nice and hooty, no need for projection, no need for production, just. Ooh. that's the ease of the of the experience you want your low extension guys you can you can also use that and i've seen in um i think it's in david's and latour's book that i was showing you earlier um they do c ah down uh, down low so c ah, and then a siren c ah. And that's how to train in a low extension for somebody who may not be predisposed that way. For me, it's like breathing out, you know, I don't need that work. But if I had a baritone who was working on his low register, uh, again, the, that, the vowel E shares the first format with the vowel U. So we use that as our entrance into, the, into that pitch range. And then you um, seal it with, a, you know, that nice ah and see what kind of, what kind of juice your voice will give you. And do you find that that as well helps when you're doing these descending patterns and you're bringing down the the lighter weight of of you know the ooze and m two bringing that down you know do you find that that helps the bass singer to sort of settle into a better vocal weight as opposed to sort of manufacturing vocal weight which which is something that we talked about earlier just sort of this idea of well I'm a bass singer therefore I need a heavy voice yeah, I love this because I hear in your question like three questions and I, you know, I want to tag them all. Um, so in a, in a nutshell, um, 
you're hitting on a lot of the strategy behind offering that to a base. Um, look, the base aesthetic is M1 and the base aesthetic is, you know, archetypal masculine. And it's very, it's not ah uh, as much as it's ah, uh, right? Um, but you can't arrive there in one day. And that's, I, I, was, I uh, gave a lesson yesterday to, uh, actually to a baritone who um, wants to be a bass and was talking to me about his dreams for, you know, low male voice outcome. And I'm like, well, you know, from what I'm hearing, you should be happy to be yourself. But I, we were talking about the, the low, the suspended larynx and how we don't force it down. We allow it to swing down constructively. For me, that was very, very hard one. And I had to work for a long time in order to integrate a relaxed, suspended larynx into my vocal production. So it's very much like this, right? You don't, you don't figure that out overnight, but you do eventually figure it out. Likewise, for low male voices, yeah, it's good to train them down with an uval, with like follow, following that, that tradition. But at the end of the day, uh, and maybe this is coming back to Ken's work. Um, I really believe in an emotional underpinning in order to arrive at that sound. So if I wanted to teach my student, instead of singing, uh, uh, which is lovely, healthy, but underemployed, and instead I want him to have, uh, uh, you can hear a cry. And look, it's a little depressed, fair enough. But you can hear a cry in the, in the production, and that's because I'm drawing on an emotional uh, subtext and affect to arrive at that function. I'm not asking my larynx to swing out and my folds to adduct and my breath pressure to emit at a certain rate. I'm actually thinking, make it hurt. Make emotionally, not physically. I'm, I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, but you've, and how many bases have we seen, you know, who are like, ah, ah, ah. it's very, you know, oh, no big deal. Ah, ah. It's very uh, base ethos. And I think there's a reason for that. You know, it's a good neuromuscular um, hacking of the system. That, I don't know if that answers your question. Did I circle? Yeah, I think so. I just want, yeah, I just want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, so I know you said it's sort of an M1 aesthetic, but again, I think all singers should train all parts of their ranges. And so... Yes. I think that's the, the emphasis is I think for a lower voiced singer, training that upper extension helps to balance out the lower just by making sure that it doesn't become too weighty and it doesn't become, yeah. And that's what I find is, is, is being able to train the, the vocal range in its entirety helps to bring balance to the entire system. Helps to, and we know that now, but that it was less apparent back in the day. I, I want to read you this tiny one sentence or two sentences from, uh, this is Garcia's uh, Ecole de Garcia. This is from his 11th edition published in 1904. This is, um, so Garcia Jr., right? The, the great voice teacher. Um, he says, Les bases profondes ont de la peine à attaquer les sons de la fosse. Um, la mode qui règle tout les a aujourd'hui par un déplorable caprice à peu près exclu du théâtre. Or les remplace par le bariton, which means basically um, basses can't really sing in falsetto. Um, today's fashion, which rules everything, has, through a cruel turn of fate, um, excluded them from the, the theater and baritones have replaced them. So that just goes to show that it's not a... It, it, the, the, the path towards you know, base suppression is well worn. I don't know if I can say that. That's, um, but the point is, even in Garcia's time, his assessment of basses is that they couldn't really sing in falsetto. And to be honest with you, at certain points in my training and development, I also have had trouble accessing my falsetto. Woo! Woo! I can do it now. Because... I've integrated it into part of my vocal training. It's so important that it stay fresh with us. Even, even basses need to sing in falsetto or head voice or whatever that M2 is that you're talking about. Well, it's interesting that, you know, um, his statement because the idea that they can't sing in falsetto or head voice or whatever you want to call it M2. Well, <laughs> Garcia, hearing, the go, have trouble. Garcia says, on de la peine à attaquer les fonds. They have trouble accessing falsetto right so, and yeah. but i think that there's almost like a built-in limitation in the sense that 
sort of up here how we're we assume that they shouldn't be able to because they're so low voiced that they shouldn't be able to you're talking about something really uh, important and it's the difference between performance vocalization and practice vocalization um those sounds that you know extremely low sound from a soprano or by turns an extremely light high falsetto from a bass are played up in performance for comedy right they're not considered legit performance timbres for either because they they subvert the expectation and the expectation for soprano is you know um angelic high light pure and for basses are masculine authority like so when you make a sound outside of those cultural um, expectations, you know, it's subversive. Well, know? that's the next thing I was going to bring up is that there, there's definitely what we expect to hear on the stage. But I think sometimes because we expect to hear this on stage, we feel like that's all we need to do or all we should be capable of. And that's, I think, where it becomes somewhat limiting and potentially dangerous and and it doesn't allow us to build, I think, to really explore our voices fully and to really build sometimes that balance into, into our, our scale. And so I think it's important for us not to use real limiting terminology or words or phrase, you know, like, like vocabulary and just saying, you know, a bass can't sing high or a soprano can't sing low or a lyric instrument isn't capable of belting or whatever it might be. Just when we start saying, these sort of broad sweeping generalizations, we start using them, then I think it affects how we think about our training and how we go about what will we expect of our own voices yes. based on what we've been classified as. And so for if you're a bass singer, it may be more difficult for you to access falsetto or M2. It may be more difficult, but does that mean that you don't continue to work toward that? And that's where I think we're really depriving ourselves of so much potential when we say, no, we can't do it. And we just throw up our hands and say, I'm just not built for that. Well, I want to come back to that because you're saying um, something very important there as well. What we've been classified as, unquote. And again, that comes back to our earlier conversation about premature classification is, it serves no one. You know, you, you, you get some keener student who wants you to, you know, they want to know exactly what, what fach they fit in what, so they can plan their next 30 years and learn all the music now? No, relax, get to know your body. Like, premature classification serves no one, really and honestly. Now, that being said, look, we're given some clues. Even, even your, your bass with a short top is, or, or your, your baritone outcome student with a short top who seems to align with a bass outcome, their, their registration events are going to be where a baritones will be. And therefore, it's, it's wise to assume that they'll have a baritone outlay and that you can work on their top and they'll eventually get it. You know, in the meantime, you do material and transposition. You make music with the voice that you have, you know, until you get the skill that, that you want. Good. Yeah. All right. We should probably wrap up. We've been going for quite a while. Oh, okay. Sure. <laughs> it's been great though. It's been really interesting. I was going to ask you actually, if there's anything else that you want to touch on um, before we wrap up and, and anything that you feel like you haven't really touched upon yet. Yeah, you know, I actually wouldn't mind um, uh, talking about CCM bases. Um, so you, you teach CCM mostly in your practice, right? And my tradition is classical singing. So classical singing has, has a, a more of a prescriptive tra tradition where there, um, and maybe this falls back to our ideas about classification, right? Classical music is more willing to tell you what you are and you better fall in line. And CCM, I feel like um, that umbrella, so, you know, pop, jazz, um, country, whatever else is possible in those popular music styles, the timbral color that's acceptable is much broader. And I hate to, I love classical music. Um, so it's not at classical music's de um, detriment that I'm, that I'm making this distinction. It's just that a collected round cultured noble sound is what I'm expected to um, create with my voice as a classical musician. 
you may have somebody who's physically built like me. And if they're singing in CCM, they're actually, their larynx is going to be jammed up. And once the larynx ascends, it can actually fake you up a fach or two. So we'll have people who in a classical idiom might have a legit low male voice outcome posing as baritones or baritenors in CCM. That's the reality. And it's what I hear on the radio as well, where the tenor reigns supreme. I've heard there's you know, three registers in singing. You've got your low register, your middle register, and the cash register. <laughs> so the tenors are, are uh, still the stars in, in pop radio, but you do get um, low male voices who, who can sort of hide out in baritone rep. And we see this in music theater sometimes as well. So there are people who are misfocked either through mistaken identity or through intention. And they're figuring out a way to try and make it work for themselves. I'm not going to make any assumptions about um, pathology or injury. I'm just going to say that it's a thing. And um, I would say that even if I go out to karaoke and I try stuff, I'm not going to sing uh, a pop song with my, you know, full operatic production. This is ridiculous, you know. Um, so it's a practice that's done. And I think that it's something that we should be aware of as we cross train as well. You know, you can sing a Johnny Cash song, but you have to rearrange it because, you know, who's, or, or actually, who was it? Cash himself actually sang uh, "Hurt." I guess a, a great. Uh, have you seen that that uh, that piece? Fantastic, right? Yeah, I hurt myself today. Blah blah blah. Oh but, yes, yes, yes. Okay. But it was a stripped down acoustic version in Cash's key because he's a legit bass, and the original guy who who sang the song is not. Right. So people find a way to make the music they want to make. All right, this has been really great, and I really appreciate your taking your time out of your day to talk with me about the low-voiced male singer. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Wonderful, and we'll chat again soon. Okay. All right, take care. A long while amid the noises of coming and going, of drinking and oaths and smutty chests, We two content, happy in just being together.